Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this combined meeting of Tuesday, May the 18th, 2021 to order. Is there any disclosure of your interest in general nature thereof? None. Approval or amendment of the meeting agenda. Moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Reedy. All those in favor? Carried. Approval of the minutes of our combined 4th, 2021. Moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Reedy. All those in favor? Is there any business arising from the minutes? Okay. None. Yes, the Kinsman Pool. Mr. Conroy. Year's project leaders in the amount of two hundred and sixty-seven thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars plus HST for project management fees and disbursements. Committee approve additional expenditures in the amount of eighty-five thousand dollars. Total value of the recommendations equal three hundred and fifty-two thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars plus applicable HST. A bit of background: a request for proposal was publicly advertised with forty-three requests for documents. The RFP closed on April 9th, 2021, with one proposal being received. The majority of the companies that requested documents were designers, builders, contractors, or suppliers that did not provide project management services. The proposal was reviewed by the following staff for compliance. It was found to meet all conditions. Ron Connery, Manager of Parks and Recreation, Brian Lewis, Manager of Operations, and Mary L. McLaughlin, Supervisor of Capital Works. Works in the submitted proposal included due diligence management services, community engagement, and development of the statement of requirement, design builder pre-qualification, procurement and contract award, and finalizing design, construction oversight and monitoring, commissioning and warranty reviews. <laughs> Additional expenses for this project include a contingency of $55,000 and $30,000 for development of fundraising strategies. The allowance of $30,000 includes the services of a professional fundraising firm to review fundraising opportunities and develop next steps based on information gathered from council and the oversight committee. Should the city choose to proceed with the implementation of a specific fundraising campaign with a consulting firm fully undertaking a fundraising project with a 12 month duration, it would cost approximately 300,000 plus HST. A report would be brought forward to committee for approval should this be the desired option. A review of industry standards show the typical fee for project management services on a project of this size is between four and eight percent, which be in the range of four hundred and eighty to nine hundred and sixty thousand dollars. The submitted proposal equates to approximately three percent of the anticipated budget. Based on the proposal review, staff believes that the Collier's Project Leaders Inc. proposal offers value for the project and with their expertise and experience in aquatic fills facilities can successfully manage this project. Collier's Project Leaders is familiar with the city's new aquatic facility project as they assisted the city in 2019 with the application for grant funding. Collier's was also the PM team for the city's successful police services building as well as the fire station design build. So some financial implications as part of the 2021 budget, $135,625 was allocated for the Kinsley Pool new aquatic facility project management. Out of this budget allocation, approximately $128,780 to cover the cost for the due diligence, community engagement, statement of requirement development, design builder proof qualifications, fundraising services, and the contingency to, to be completed in 2021. The remaining costs will be awarded, will be expensed in subsequent years, 2022 through 2024 budgets. Thank you, councillors. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. It's nice to see this matter uh, moving forward so that we can uh, uh, get a, a new pool constructed. I see that there's certain items there for food for thought for a little bit later, but I think the, uh, oh, uh, I think that the, uh, the main item or thrust this evening is to get this awarded to uh, Colliers and uh, nice to see that uh, uh, recognition uh, to them for all the great work that they've done in the past for us, whether it be the police station or the uh, fire hall. With all that in mind, I'd like to put forward a motion that the project man management services be awarded to Colliers project leaders in the amount of 267880 plus HST for the project management fees and disbursements additional expenditures of 85,000 
for a total value of 352800 uh, plus applicable HST. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Reavy. Comments? Uh, Councillor Giacono. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm glad to see this uh, moving ahead as well. Of course, the uh, Pool Advisory Committee uh, has not met recently due to the uh, COVID uh, problems we've been encountering, but uh, with this additional step forward, I'm sure that we'll be able to proceed and uh, uh, make some headway. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? No other comments? Okay, I'd like to call the vote. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. Canadian Red Cross request, Mrs. Sorial. So the Canadian Red Cross is attempting to start a public education pilot project. The project is called Inclusive Resilience, Reducing Disaster Risks for Canadians. This research project focuses on disaster risk reduction by improving communication and public engagement with populations who are at higher risk of impacts from disasters like flooding, wildfires, and earthquakes. Uh, disasters such as flooding has impacted the city of Pembroke, so they thought we would be, the Red Cross thought we would be a good fit. The goal of this research is to increase awareness of disaster risks and promote approaches and tools and actions that foster inclusive disaster risk reduction and preparedness among at-risk Canadians in select communities. So they've looked at targeting certain demographics such as seniors, women's, newcomers to Canada and Indigenous people. The project will increase awareness of risk and prepare residents to become more disaster resilient. Pembroke, Ottawa and several other communities in Renfrew County have been selected as part of this Red Cross pilot project. So there are five communities across Canada that will be part of the project. During the initial phase, the city's role would be just to assist in communicating the survey request to Pembroke residents using the city's website and social media outlets. The Red Cross would actually do the conducting of the telephone surveys. If the city becomes a participant in the project, Red Cross would like to begin the surveys in June or July of this year. The city would also facilitate participation and logistics for uh, focus group discussions and the Red Cross would conduct the discussions themselves. Uh, the city would also be responsible to revise communication tools within our emergency plan based on the outcome of the surveys and the focus groups and the city would commit to supporting the national campaign for this project if the pilot project is successful. So the role of the city is very limited but the outcome of the project could provide meaningful, meaningful information in regards to emergency management and how information is provided to the city of Pembroke residents. So this pilot project will form a big part of our city's education program, which is required uh, as a yearly requirement under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. So it's a four year program. And because of COVID, they wanted to start last year, but they're going to start this year. So year one is the project design, mobilization of partners like city and getting community engagement and baseline data collection going. Year two would be development and rollout of the disaster risk reduction approaches and activities. And year three would be to review those approaches and adapt and continue implementation based on community feedback. And the final year would be to consolidate and share the practices and lessons learned and uh, conduct a national awareness campaign. So to be part of this project, the city must indicate its intent to participate in this inclusive resilience reducing disaster risk for Canadians program. All costs for this project would be borne by the Canadian Red Cross. So it is recommended that the city become a partner with the Canadian Red Cross for this program. And if the city is willing to do this, a motion is needed and then a letter from the mayor and CAO would need to be, would be required by the Red Cross. Thank you, comments. Uh, Councillor Reavy. Thank you, Your Worship. When I read this, I thought, oh, what an excellent opportunity for the city and I mean, the Red Cross. Uh, we all know the quality of that organization and um, that they're willing or have even asked us when there's only going to be five communities across Canada is, mm -hmm. is um, 
you know, it would certainly put Pembroke's name on the national stage in some respects. So I'm all for um, for putting forth the motion to uh, to go ahead with this and um, submit our intent to participate with the letter. Uh, Council Lafreniere. Yeah, I will second that motion. I just want to say that I think it just makes sense. Um, you know, when you're planning, like our emergency planning and the uh, the uh, exercises you go through, it only makes sense to have Red Cross involved in, in how we are implementing things during a crisis because we all too often are going to call on them or residents are also going to call on them. So it's nice to see the silos kind of coming together because it's often that everyone works in their own little pea pod and then when something happens, you know, you're looking into someone's envelope to see what have they got to offer. So not that the city's emergency uh, committee wasn't doing a great job, but this is just going to make it more streamlined, I would imagine, if something actually happened. Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I have to uh, agree with the statements. Red, Red Cross is a very, uh, it's a valuable, uh, you know, agency that helps in times of crisis. I'm just wondering where are they located in the city? Are they here or have they moved? Mrs. Sorrell? Uh, through you, Your Worship, um, they don't have an office anymore um, in the, they used to have it in Laurentian Valley, but it's no longer there. So um, they're, the main office is out of Ottawa, and um, they're they're reaching out through their Ottawa office. So, uh, if I may, the response times in times of emergency, they're only a hundred miles away, right? Uh, through you, Your Worship, there are actual volunteers that live in our community here. So, all it is is we would we would if there was an emergency, we call the Ottawa number, and then they go through their call out fan out list and reach out to all of the um, Pembroke, Laurentian Valley, Pitawawa air and area uh, volunteers. So it would be quicker than 100 miles, like they would be here instantaneously. Thank you. Any other comments? Motion on the floor. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Parking meter report, Mrs. Sorial. So at the January 5th, uh, combined committee of council meeting, the committee directed staff to extend the parking meter pilot project until June 30th of 2021. So now that that deadline for this pilot project is approaching, um, committee direction is required whether to extend the pilot project or return to paid parking at the meters. So as you'll remember, the intent of the pilot project was to permit uh, two hour free parking at the meters in the downtown core for a six month period from January 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2020. Subsequent to this direction, an extension to December 31st, 2020 was granted due to the impacts of COVID-19. And then again, the committee agreed to a further extension to this June, the end of June, because again of COVID. The PBIA has requested another six month extension specifically due to COVID uh, and its impact on local businesses. If another extension is granted, the parking bylaw must be allowed, uh, uh, sorry, amended to allow this two hour free parking area at the meters. A second request, um, a request has re been received from the Pembroke Public Library. They would like the five metered parking spaces on Victoria Street in front of the library to become permanent free two hour parking spaces. In their letter, they indicated that this area lost parking spaces when Victoria Street was reconstructed. Prior to the reconstruction, there were eight parking spaces, which included one barrier-free space. There are now five metered parking spaces, three uh, barrier-free parking spaces, and one 10-minute space in front of Victoria Street and uh, Rainford Street. So for a total of nine um, parking spaces, and further, the city will be creating additional parking behind the old fire station, now the grind, to include seven public parking spaces, along with 15 additional parking spaces for the 50 plus active living center and five parking spaces for the grind. So there will actually be more parking in this area than before. 
And further, there's already 10 parking spaces located behind the Pembroke Public Library parking lot behind their building. So it is recommended that this request be deferred until a final decision has been made for all of the downtown meters. So in regards to financial implications, the 2021 bylaw enforcement budget allowed for the two hour free parking at the meters from January to June only. So there would be an impact to the budget if this extension is granted. It is anticipated there would be a further loss of parking meter revenue of approximately $25,000 if the parking uh, is extended to the end of 2021. It is recommended that if the parking meter program is extended until the end of the year, the loss of revenue could be financed from the anticipated 2020 uh, accumulated surplus fund. So your direction is required um, on two areas. One is whether to extend the two hour parking meter pilot project until the end of the year, December 31st, 2021 for the downtown parking meters and whether to grant or defer the Pembroke Public Library request for permanent two hour free parking at the five meters in front of the library on Victoria Street. Thank you. For discussion purposes, we'll divide it into two. So let's begin, first of all, discussion on the extension re requested by the PBIA. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I'm a little concerned as to the, uh, the uh, wording uh, that's an extension of a parking meter pilot project. Uh, in my view, uh, the issue of having a parking meter uh, pilot project that uh, an individual could go and hopefully look at some statistics and see if it encouraged people to shop downtown and so forth. I think that's blown out of the water for the last over a year due to uh, COVID. However, having said that, the way the PBIA is phrasing it, can we have uh, basically the the, uh, the no uh, parking or parking free uh, for two hours uh, due to COVID? That I don't have as much of an issue with if it was for a short duration. Um, having said that, I recognize what's being said in terms of where the funds are coming from, um, but uh, I would be inquiring of staff as to uh, whether A, is there any COVID funding available uh, so that it could come firstly from there, because this is, in my mind, directly related to COVID, or alternatively, if there, the indication is that it could come from an anticipated 2020 accumulated surplus, uh, does Ms. Sorio have any uh, information for us to at least, no, I'm looking for a, a, an exact dollar amount, but some something to um, assure me that there is an accumulated surplus that uh, is available uh, for this use. Uh, Ms. Sorio. Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, it is anticipated the uh, 2020 surplus will be uh, over $700,000. A more detailed report will be provided by the Treasurer at the June 1st Combined Committee uh, meeting. Further, according to the Treasurer, there's a sufficient safe restart COVID funds that are available uh, to cover the revenue shortfall. The City's um, COVID funds are forecasted at $323,000 for 2021. So there's two options. Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Your Worship. So I'd be, uh, I echo the Deputy Mayor saying that this is a COVID relation. Uh, we should probably pull those funds from the COVID uh, restart. And that way we can, uh, hopefully this is all behind us at the end of summer and we can start fresh with a, a, something new uh, next year. So I would uh, put on them, uh, really put the motion on the floor that we we extend the uh, two hour free parking until the end of the year, or I guess it was December 31st, uh, using the COVID safe restart funds. Is there a seconder? Deputy Mayor seconded. Uh, Councilor Lafreniere. No, I just wanted to say that I agreed with uh, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I also think that going forward, it is something we're going to look at. People are going to get used to the free parking. I mean, right now they're going down and they're either doing curbside pickup or they're parking to use some services that are open or they're parking and then going to the beautiful marina. So I think going forward, if we're learning to live without these proceeds, we should seriously look at maybe only controlling parking in the problem areas. Uh, and opening up free parking a little more in, in the areas where we know people are going to be 
you know, supporting local business and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, I support the motion, but I think it's uh, something we need to talk about after COVID as well. Councillor Reedy. Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but sure, I agree with everything. Um, we definitely have to have that conversation about parking in general, and I do agree with Patricia that, or Councillor Frenier, that we are living without the revenue, and on a uh, go-forward basis, we should be considering that. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, the motion's on the floor. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, the next discussion is the recommendation uh, in regard to the library where the staff is recommending it be deferred. Comments, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I like the third option, which is deny. Um, I say that because I don't know why we would deal with certain sections of our downtown in a piecemeal uh, fashion. Um, so. For everything that the that uh, Ms. Sorio has indicated, I am aware that there's parking because when I go to the library board meetings, I'm aware that there's parking behind the building. I'm aware that there's parking in the area. I think what uh, was being requested by the library is trying to originally that some of the discussion was having dedicated free parking near the library to try and facilitate or to encourage people to use the library, but I don't know necessarily that that's required. In light of the report about the number of parking spaces uh, around the library, I don't know whether, or, like I don't believe that there's a need to try and piecemeal and dedicate some free parking near the library uh, for that purpose. Um, I would be more interested in knowing, I, I guess, is if, if that parking still was found to be insufficient, uh, uh, is whether there can be a, uh, a relationship or some discussion uh, between the library and Ms. Sorio's office as to some additional parking spaces that could be uh, provided, uh, paid provided, uh, parking spaces somewhere further from the library that staff could park there, walk to uh, to work to free up additional spaces behind the library for patrons. Uh, uh, I know whether it be for our office or if you go to Walmart or any other place, you see often employees parking further away from the uh, uh, from the establishment to leave sufficient parking for their for their patrons. So I'd be curious about that. But for tonight's purposes. I, I'm, I'm not fond of deferring and I'm not fond of, uh, of granting. I, I think it should be a denial. Council Lafreniere. I was going to um, support the defer, deferral, but after, in, after hearing from someone who actually sits on the library board, I respect his opinion. Um, someone who goes there often for meetings, uh, things like that, um, I would support just denying and, uh, I mean, see how everything goes. But you're right, they have a parking lot behind there. Yeah, I don't see the need. Are you putting a motion on the floor, Councilor sure. Lafreniere? Yeah, I would move uh, that we deny the uh, request. Is there a seconder? Councilor Giacono seconded. Comments, Councilor Giacono? Yes, Your Worship, uh, I believe there's adequate parking in the area. And uh, as the Deputy Mayor alluded to, if, uh, you know, if staff is utilizing the, uh, the rear of the library, I think that should be made available to people that are, you know, perhaps some senior citizens who can walk a short distance. That would be more than adequate. I think, I think we have enough parking in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Reavy. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I agree what Councillor Jackno just said um, in regards to uh, having the accessible parking that is um, at the rear of the library in that lot. So, you know, if staff are using that on a daily basis to park, they should be encouraged to park elsewhere um, so that people that do need the accessibility of the, of the lift are able to park where they need to. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, there's a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Fire hydrant relocation, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. 
The operations department recommends the following. Committee not approve the request for fire hydrant relocation at 699 Elgin Street at city cost and that the property owner be informed that relocation is possible with all costs to the property owner. The city received written request from the property owner of 699 Elgin Street to relocate an existing fire hydrant to allow for driveway widening. The written request, including photos, has been attached to the report. The property owner was unavailable to attend to personally make the request, however, asked staff formally present to committee. In March, staff received the initial request and formally responded in writing that all costs associated with relocation would be the responsibility of the property owner. As noted in the report, the present owner purchased the home in 2019. The home had a single driveway and a single car garage with the hydrant immediately adjacent to the driveway. The house was constructed in 2011-2012 by a previous owner. At that, at that time, there was a request to relocate the hydrant. During a site visit, city staff informed the owner that there would be a cost to relocate and that an alternate solution was to flip the house plan the opposite way to avoid the conflict. The 2012 picture included in the re committee report uh, shows the house partially complete with the hydrant outside of the single width driveway. The property was originally part of the now Gulfview subdivision properties and was never owned by the city of Pembroke. It was designated at the time uh, of the water main and hydrant construction as a road allowance to that subdivision. Staff have com confirmed without going to the expense of a legal survey that the hydrant is on private property and is within the Elgin Street Road Allowance. It is normal practice to have the hydrant installations coincidental to the property line to limit obstruction. It isn't always possible, however, when there's a conflict with hydro poles, utility boxes and other infrastructure. There is a significant cost associated with relocation, which include water main shut down to the dead end water main, significant flushing and testing that would be required. The soils are sandy in this particular area and there would be a large excavation requiring the need to hold the hydro pole up. There would be a need for significant traffic control as it is a dead end street and that could include the use of temporary traffic signals or a detour road over the east side ditch and that would require the provision for drainage works. If relocated, there would be two asphalt cuts into Elgin Street to remove the existing uh, hydrant and lead and to install a new hydrant and lead. The new hydrant would have to be installed towards the middle of the property to avoid conflict with the existing poles and to keep reasonable spacing of the other hydrants on the street. The relocation to the front of the, of the hydro pole would create issues with snow storage for the city along Elgin Street as well as for the property owner and the neighbor. There is the poten uh, potential alternate solution to widen the driveway towards the center of the property, avoiding the conflict with the hydrant. The driveway must remain, <clears throat> excuse me, the driveway must remain a maximum of 20 feet uh, in width or a minor variance would be required. The driveway culvert, it, a driveway culvert is not required as drainage in this particular area of Elgin Street is done through dry wells. As this is a very complicated relocation and a number of factors that come into play, the estimated cost is between $12,000 and $20,000, and it could be higher depending on the conditions that we uh, encounter at the time of the work. There is no budget for this work. Um, and just to note, there are numerous areas in the city where conflicts of this nature exist uh, with various different pieces of infrastructure, including other hydrants, and we have had previous requests and all those requests have been denied. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, comments. Uh, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to confirm, I guess this, the present owner bought the single family home in 2019. So they knew what they were buying uh, and it certainly shouldn't be on the taxpayer to pay for someone that makes a decision that they want now to move the fire hydrant. So I would agree and uh, deny this uh, application. Councillor Lafreniere. I understand uh, the recommendation to deny the request, but I do have a question. Um, when someone's building a new home in the city of Pembroke and they provide us with a site plan, that type of thing, do we not try to curb them away from putting a driveway that close to the fire hydrant? Um, 
just a question. Uh, can we deny the site plan agreement if this is happening? Because I, I know there's a couple of them. I actually live on Eldon Street. I don't stand to gain any money from this decision, but there is a couple on my street like that. Brian, you probably know about the one, the other one on the, our street, um, closer to the old track. Um, but yeah, so when a site plan comes to us for a residential home, do we not have the right to say, you've got to move the driveway? Uh, Mrs. Sorio, could you comment? Uh, we actually did for this particular one. Um, and we asked them to move the garage onto the other side of the house um, so that they could have the driveway on the opposite side. And they refused. And they knew um, what they were what they were dealing with at the time. Um, so we do try and uh, be proactive like that as well. But if they don't want to do it, then, then well, we're thank you. But maybe we should start saying no. Like, it just looks ridiculous, too, to be honest, when you're walking by. I know one other one, just the driveway, literally three feet, the hydrant's in the driveway almost. So I think he built something around it because he kept running into it. But, <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Are there any other comments? Okay, do we, we need a motion here. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, for all the reasons that have been mentioned in the report, uh, as well as uh, the comments by uh, Councillor uh, Plummer. I would move that uh, committee not approve the request for the fire hydrant relocation at 699 Elgin Street. Uh, is that seconded by Councillor Plummer? Did I see your hand? Thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor? Carried, thank you. The NDP MP intake for Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. The Operations Department recommends the committee approve the extension of works related to NDMP intake four for the Moffat Street Slope Stability Project. As I'm sure everyone will remember in 2017 and 2019, due to extreme weather events, properties on Moffat Street suffered extensive slope failures along the Indian River Banks and the Muskrat River Banks. <clears throat> to assist residents with the issues, the city applied for and was successful in an application under intake four of the National Disaster Mitigation Program for mitigation planning. A study was completed and a mitigation strategy was developed. The NDMP intake four program has been extended and the city was approved to use the unexpended funds towards designing mitigation measures in some of the areas worst affected. At the direction of committee, intake number five of NDMP was not applied for as a, at that time, the program had a minimum project size of $20 million and the city needed to fund 60% of those final costs. There is the potential that a similar program to construct mitigation measures may come back um, in, in a smaller scale, but we have yet to be informed of that program. I mentioned that as uh, I just want to make sure everyone understands that the extension of intake four is for design only. It actually will not construct any of the mitigations. It will allow us to have uh, design on the shelf ready should there be funding sources in the future. <clears throat> The remaining funds in the project line item is just under $102,000 funding from the federal government and the city with the city's share being approximately $51,000. Motion to approve moving forward with the re is required and the contribution agreement will be before council in the future once we have that agreement received. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to make a comment before we, we move further in regards to Moffat Street. This has been ongoing now since 2017. Presently, uh, Mr. Lewis and the Operations Department have been working hard and watching, you know, where are grants becoming available. And we know we voted uh, when there was only the 20 million and you either took the 20 million or you didn't, did not make sense for a municipality like ours. And uh, what we've been doing for the last year uh, with our MP, Minister Yakabuski, is working to have a meeting with Minister Clark, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, and they are working on that now, which would involve, okay, discussion, how do we mitigate moving forward? At the moment, as Mr. Lewis said, uh, there is an indication at the federal level that uh, there will be money available, 
and uh, also there's a chance that the province would also help out. Uh, nothing has been confirmed, but at least it is moving forward, and I guess what I am not too happy with, it is taking a long time to get anything done. So I'm in favour of, uh, of the Operation Department's recommendation here. Okay, comments from uh, Councillor Reavy. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for the report, Mr. Lewis. I would be prepared to make the motion um, that we approve the extension of works related to the NDMP intake for, for the Moffat Street uh, Slope Stability Project. Counts our Deputy Mayor. I would second that motion. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, the motion on the floor. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. NDMP intake six. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. More about the National Disaster Mitigation Program. The Operations Department recommends committee approve the use of funds from the Moffat Street Storm Outfall Project Outfall 27 for the NDMP intake six program for citywide flood risk assessment and storm outlet review. At a special operations committee meeting last November, council approved the submission of an application for the NDMP intake six program for citywide flood risk assessment and storm outlet review. On May 3rd of this year, the city received approval of our application in the amount of $250,000 of federal funding with the city's 50% share being $250,000. <clears throat> the project entails a study of the entire city related to areas of concern for inland flooding. Most of these areas are related to what we refer to as choke points in the storm sewer system, where significant rain events may cause flooding if the water can't get away quick enough. Also included is a review of our storm outfalls where drainage and sufficient outlet may not be available. The need for a study of this nature has significant increase uh, with the effects of climate change and the intensity and duration of rain events. The 2020 budget for the Moffat Street Storm Outfall 27 is allocated at, at $510,000. The original tent, intent of that project is to restore the minor outfall damaged by years of erosion and then contribute to the NDMP program if we were successful with this application. The Outfall 27 project is a short-term solution and it is much needed uh, as quickly as possible and the department had planned for the remaining funds if they were not needed for the NDMP intake six to be used to design the long-term solution for storm drainage on Moffat Street, Margaret Street, Welland Street and those streets that cross Moffat Street on its way down to Pembroke Street West. That is the long-term goal for the future of drainage off of Moffat Street. $260,000 will remain in the budget for outfall 27 with 250,000 being reallocated to the citywide flood risk assessment and outfall review. Again, a motion is required to move forward and the contribution agreement will be before council when it is received from the program coordinators. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lafreniere. So I support this transfer of funds for this use. So I would put forward a motion to support the recommendation. Is there a seconder for the motion? Councillor Reavy, thank you. Any other comments? Just further to that, that I think, I mean, we all know the work has to be done. Um, this is a great use of dollars that are already been allocated just to mitigate some problems that we're already seeing down there. So uh, good way to change directions, Brian. Thank you. No further comments. All those in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you very much. Supply and delivery of a single axle cab. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. The Operations Department recommends the following. Committee approve the award of the supply and delivery of one single axle cab and chassis with combination dump body spreader with hydraulic plow and wing. RFP number P-21-04 to Bill Cluche and Sons Limited known as Valley Truck and Spring Service in the amount of $232,900 plus HST. 
The RFP was publicly advertised and closed on April 22nd with two proponents submitting. Submitted proposals were reviewed by the Roads and Fleet Supervisor, the subformant of Roads, and the Chief Mechanic. Scoring was done individually and compiled with the Deputy Treasurer monitoring. Proposals were evaluated using predetermined criteria as listed in the RFP, and it's also noted in this report. The recommendation for award is based on a bang for your buck approach and scores based on technical merit, then includes the cost at the end using a point system for dollar measurement. The summary of the scores is attached in the evaluation matrix. Based on the review, the evaluation committee believes the Valley Truck and Spring proposal offers the best value for the project. $270,000 was allocated for the purchase in the 2021 budget. Surplus funds will remain in the fleet reserve for future fleet purchases. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would move that we approve the uh, recommendation from the Operations Department to award this request uh, for proposal to Valley Truck and Spring. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Giacono, any comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Carried, thank you very much. Internal structural review, Mr. LaPierre. Thank you, Your Worship. It is recommended that Council establish the position of clerk in place of the current position of deputy clerk and further that the current deputy clerk be appointed to the position of clerk. It's also further recommended that the salary range for the position of clerk be established at level nine of the city's salary grid, which is one level higher than the current position of deputy clerk. The recommendation is based on the internal structural review report presented to council in caucus on May 4th, 2021, and enabling bylaws have been prepared for council consideration this evening. I should point out that traditionally, the, uh, the responsibilities of clerk are also assigned to the CAO. However, more communities in the province of Ontario and indeed in the county of Renfrew are moving to separate the two positions to allow the CAO to focus more on council strategic initiatives and not having to deal with the day-to-day -day operations of the clerk's office. Uh, such communities in Renfrew County include the town of Deep River, the town of Iron Pryor, the uh, regional uh, township of Whitewater, as well as the town of Renfrew, who's always had a clerk. And most recently, the town of Petawawa has established the clerk position. Thank you. Uh, council? Comments? Councillor Giacono. Your Worship, uh, I believe that is a, uh, truly will be a, a sage move on behalf of this council uh, so that we can move forward and allow uh, the CAO and the actual clerk uh, to, you know, to function at uh, different levels, which will be more than beneficial to the, to the community. So uh, I, I truly believe that uh, this will help us advance. Councillor Plummer. I agree with the report. Uh, just a question though, is as this will be coming forward in a bylaw, do we need to make a motion on this? No, you do not need a motion. It's an information item because you're right. The enabling bylaws will be before council this evening. Great, well then I have no issues. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Reeve. All those in favor? Okay, we are now adjourned. Thank you.
I'd like to call this council meeting of Tuesday, May the 18th, 2021 to order. But before opening this meeting of council, I'd ask those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Thank you. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? None. Uh, our minutes of our regular meeting held, of council held on May the 4th, 2021. We have a motion, please. Moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Lafreniere. All those in favor? Carried. Adopting the minutes from our combined committee meeting, which was held on May the 4th, 2021. Moved by Councilor Lafreniere, seconded by Councilor Jackano. All those in favor? Carried. Receiving the minutes from the Pembroke Heritage Mural uh, Committee meeting held on May the 5th, 2021. Moved by Councilor Reavy, seconded by Councilor Plummer. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, the combined uh, committee report, Councilor Lafreniere. Thank you. Your combined committee of council begs to report and recommend from its meeting held this evening as follows. Moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Plummer, that proposal number P21-02 for project management services, new aquatic facility, be awarded to Collier's project leaders in the amount of $267,880 plus HST, and that council approve additional expenditures in the amount of $85,000. Total value of the recommendations equal $352,880 plus applicable HST. Thank you, any comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Carried, thank you. Uh, the Burkhan Development Agreement, Councillor Reavy. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Jack No, that bylaw 2021-29, being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and chief administrative officer to enter into an agreement with Burgom Developments Incorporated, be adopted and further that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and filled with the seal of the corporation. Any comments? Uh, yes, Your Worship, this was um, a one-year extension as discussed and approved at our combined committee meeting of uh, May the 4th. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Appointing a bylaw office, uh, enforcement officer, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Frenier, that bylaw 2021-30, a bylaw to appoint municipal bylaw enforcement officers to enforce parking provisions in the parking lots associated with the Pembroke Regional Hospital be adopted and passed and further the said bylaw be signed with the mayor and clerk and seal the seal of the corporation. Thank you. Any comments? It's self-explanatory. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Appointing a clerk, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reavy, that bylaw 2021 31, a bylaw to appoint a clerk for the City of Pembroke, be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you. Any comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Appoint Chief Administrative Officer, Councillor Reavy, slash Deputy you. Clerk. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Giacomo, that bylaw 2021-32, a bylaw to appoint a chief administrative officer slash deputy clerk for the city of Pembroke be adopted and passed. And further that said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Any comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Designate a head for the purpose of MFIPPA, Council Lafreniere. Uh, Councilor Lafreniere, your 
can't hear you. Okay, sorry about that. I clicked the wrong spot. Okay, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Plummer, that bylaw 2021-33, a bylaw to designate a head for the purposes of the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act be adopted and passed. And further that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Thank you, any comments? No, this just allows people to do their job with authority. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. Mayor's report. I received a, a letter from the Pembroke Horticultural Society that I would like to, to read. It was very difficult for them to, especially with COVID-19, of arranging to come to speak to council. But I'd like to make, uh, make the letter public and uh, it reads as follows. Dear Mr. LeMay, in just 30 months, Pembroke Horticulture Society will celebrate 100 years of helping keep Pembroke beautiful. As partners and previously seeing Pembroke voted the prettiest little city in Canada, we take pride in our long-standing volunteer contributions. Looking forward to our 2024 100-year celebration, discussions have begun regarding a suitable project to mark the achievement. For the last two decades, our society has been heavily involved in enhancing and maintaining the many horticultural features at Pembroke's Waterfront Park, which is hailed by many as the jewel of the city. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the park has provided invaluable outdoor opportunities for all our citizens and shown how crucial this waterfront green space has become. Not surprisingly, the waterfront became the focus of attention for our 100 year celebration project. In what follows, we wish to formally raise a proposal to enhance the area between the former CP rail line and Fred Blackstein Boulevard. The concept of developing a waterfront arbitorium as our 100 year celebration project has been formally endorsed by the Pembroke Horticultural Society. This proposal is being supported by expertise from Algonquin College with funding assistance confidently anticipated from the Pembroke Petawawa District Community Foundation. The green space proposed for the arbitorium is currently used by the public for many leisure activities from unorganized sports to family picnics. The concept of an arbitorium would not deter those activities, but rather be a perfect fit, making the entire waterfront park even more of a people place. The arbitorium in Ottawa and also Guelph both attract huge numbers of tourists annually with significant economic benefits to surrounding businesses. The tourism impact and economic benefits to Pembroke's downtown core should be similar and some will remember the heyday of the swallow roost. Visitors came from near and far to enjoy this evening spectacle, which proved to be a great promotion for the city. We envisage the project developing over a period of five to seven years with the planting of approximately 10 specimen trees annually, having appropriate interpretive signage beside each tree. These interpretive signs would be similar to the highly successful Kiwanis initiative completed three years ago with a dozen educational locations. Funding is anticipated from service clubs, corporations, and families. The Community Foundation has indicated support, and a private citizen has already pledged to match this amount up to $10,000. With so few cities having an arbitorium, one would expect genuine civic pride in hosting one, with Pembroke being the envy of Eastern Ontario. Recipients of this letter might wish to Google Pembroke Waterfront Park and click on Reviews. There you will find 450 five-star ratings with many extremely complimentary visitor remarks. Imagine the addition of an arbitorium to this location. This correspondence is intended to inform Pembroke City Council of the Horticultural Society's desire to enter discussions on the Waterfront Arbitorium proposal as soon as the provincial regulations permit. We would welcome the opportunity to further detail the plan for council by walking the area, followed by a brief presentation at the Waterfront Amphitheater. This format would be similar to the 2019 flood recovery tour conducted for council in the wake of that disaster. 
In the interim, as partners with the city in enhancing our overall outdoor environment, we humbly request an update should any action occur on the commercial development of the site. In closing, it's important to note that Fred Blackstein, who chaired and continues to lead the Millennium Waterfront Development Project, and Jay McLaren, a past president of the Horticulture Society, are both major participants in the Waterfront Arbitorium Initiative. Respectfully, Catherine Hughley, uh, president of the Pembroke Horticultural Society, and Terry McCann, the vice president. So we're looking forward to the presentation from the Horticultural Society. I'd also like to provide a report on behalf of Councillor Abdallah, who is the council rep uh, representative on the Pembroke Heritage Mural Committee. The Heritage Murals Committee is pleased to report that we have recently engaged local contractors to conduct repairs on three mural sites. Speedboro Science has installed 23 new portraits on the mayors of Pembroke 1877 to 2014 this April. Last summer's heat was very hard on the portraits. Speedpro Signs installed 16 new portraits last year. In April, Frank's Electric has installed new lamps in the eight cornices at Margaret Duville and her mission. Many residents will be pleased to see the lights are back on this 1992 mural by Pierre Hardy. Walsh Brothers Construction installed a wide gap, or cap, on the lumbering industry the week of May the 10th. It's located on the Scotiabank building. By way of a grant acquired by the ACFO Champlain for Pembroke Heritage Murals, we have two projects on the go. First, the translation of the full description of the murals document into French that will be posted along with the English version on the Heritage Murals page located on the city's website. Second, videos were taken of all 34 murals over April the 26th and April the 27th. The completed videos will be posted to our YouTube account. A link to this account will be on the murals webpage. We will receive these completed projects from ACFO Champlain on June the 30th. This month, the committee is working on plans to repair and restore some murals this summer. The murals committee are very appreciative of the support we have received over 30 plus years from Pemba Council and staff, numerous businesses, property owners, contractors, parking authority, parks and recreation, and operations department. We'd like to remind people that touring murals is a safe activity. Mural descriptions and a map are free downloads from the city's website. They can be printed off or saved to your device. This week, we received exciting news as all residents 18 and over are now able to book a COVID-19 vaccine appointment. The Renfrew County District Health Unit shared that already 45% of residents in Renfrew County have received their first dose of the vaccine. This coupled with the beautiful spring weather makes me optimistic as we move forward. With regards to vaccines, the health unit has asked that as much as possible, residents use their online booking system for vaccine appointments. They have been inundated with calls and aim to provide all information required on their website. Some important things to keep in mind to help things run smoothly for the health unit, book only one appointment per person. If you book an appointment, keep it and show up. If you do, not, if you do need to change your appointment, please counsel through the link in your confirmation email and that's very important. While this is all very exciting, we do remain under a stay-at-home order due to high case numbers. Under the current provincial lockdown, you should only be interacting in person with those in your household. In addition to limiting your close contacts, wearing a mask when you're out in public, and staying home if you are sick are essential at this time. At the City of Pembroke, we have closed all of our offices to the public and are having staff work from home wherever possible. In accordance with provincial guidelines, many outdoor recreational amenities have been closed in addition to indoor recreational amenities. Thankfully, playgrounds and open parks and trails remain open. With that being said, if you cannot keep a two meter distance in these areas, please wear a mask for the safety of everyone. 
I would once again like to thank our frontline workers, our educators, and our local business community who have continued to do an excellent job adapting their operations and keeping our community safe. Lastly, as last week was Nurses Week, I'd like to sincerely thank all of the nurses in our area who have been working incredibly hard during this pandemic to keep us all safe. You truly are the heroes in our community. I encourage everyone to have a safe and happy Victoria Day weekend. There are plenty of COVID safe outdoor activities here in the city. Visit Pembroke.ca and check out our homepage for Pemby's Picks, a weekly news uh, e-newsletter about things that occur in the city of Pembroke. Are there any notices of motion? Uh, seeing none. Councillor reports. Councillor Reavy. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to bring a little bit of information and uh, a summary of a few events taking place with respect to the Diversity Advisory Committee. Um, although we are young in our being, uh, we've already become extremely active with three meetings under our belt. We've elected uh, uh, co-chairs, um, which in the near future, uh, these people will, will come to council to say hello, introduce themselves. Right now, we have um, quite an initiative underway. So on May 5th, the city uh, launched a diversity, equity, and inclusion community survey. The survey was a recommendation from the Diversity Advisory Committee to better understand the experiences of the BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, People of Colour, and LGBTQ2S plus members of our community. The survey is open to any past or present resident of Pembroke and area and will be open until June 7th. The survey can be accessed by visiting the City of Pembroke's website, clicking on Residents, and then Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. If a community member would like a hard copy of the survey, they can call the City and request one. Thus far, and this is surprising, we have received 185 responses to the survey. So with that, the next step will be to host a diversity, equity and inclusion virtual roundtable on Wednesday, May 26, 2021 from 5 p.m. until 6.30 p.m. The virtual roundtable will take place over Zoom and is open to BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus members of the community to attend. The roundtable is intended to complement the survey and give another way in which BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus members of the community can share their experiences with racism and discrimination in Pembroke. The roundtable is specifically intended for BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus community members, while the survey is open to anyone Individuals must pre-register for the roundtable by visiting pembroke.ca, clicking on Residents and the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion tab. The information from these two activities will help the Diversity Advisory Committee form their recommendations to Council and will be shared with other local organizations such as the OPP, mental health services and social services to help them improve diversity, equity and inclusion from their organization's perspectives. So again, that's a lot of information, but um, at the very uh, end of it all, this, the survey is open. Please, as many people uh, complete it, whether you have had any experiences or not, just uh, you may have seen, heard things. and. Um, you know, the, this information is very valuable. Valuable. Uh, a few other things that are on the horizon, we can expect to see a monthly column uh, in the Daily Observer, as well as a diversity garden. So that, stay tuned, I'll bring you information for that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lafreniere. Thank you. Um... The mayor and I both sit on the health committee at the county level um, and this past meeting that was held on May 12th, the Renfrew County paramedics 
Chief Mike Nolan presented a rather concerning report on the increasing severity of the local opioid epidemic. Now this is really concerning and quite disturbing um, as it affects not only the people suffering from this addiction, but their families, their sisters, their parents, grandparents, co-workers. I mean, it, it gets into the fiber of a community. So I'm going to read you uh, some of the report that came forward, and I'm sure some of you will be shocked by some of the information you're going to hear. So the paramedics are now responding to multiple overdoses daily and are voicing their concerns about what they're witnessing throughout Renfrew County. It goes without saying that there are most likely many going unreported as well because of these are the only these are only the overdoses that they call the paramedics. Many are happening and people are handling it themselves or people are dying. Um, in the first 18 weeks of 2021, paramedics have transported 28 patients who overdosed. That's compared to 24 in the entire year of 2020. 18 in 2019, 16 in 2017, and 2018. Now these numbers does not include the fatalities. These are only the people that survived the overdoses. Uh, he noted that paramedics are seeing overdoses of both prescription and non-prescription medications, as well as a lot of mail order recreational drug use, which has unintended consequences. One year ago, paramedics in Renfrew County responded to approximately one overdose per week. Two months ago, it was approximately two a week. Last month, paramedics responded, as I said, to one overdose per day to now multiple overdoses per day. I mean, the pandemic has affected people with substance abuse uh, in paramount uh, numbers. Uh, he noted overdoses are similar to suicides in that they're often not spoken publicly about because of the stigma. But he sees this as an opportunity for the paramedics to share the information with all of us about what is going on in the community versus the perception among residents. And these are people that need help. Um, it, mental health, physical health, they've been separated for far too long and this was discussed at the health committee level. Um, as last time we checked, the brain is part of the body. And I think it's time that it was recognized, uh, not just at local level or among people that maybe don't understand addiction and mental health, but uh, we need to, to, to make echoes of this through the upper levels of government. Uh, so in some ways, the paramedics are trying to speak for those who are not speaking for themselves to be able to lean into this issue not only as paramedic services and county, but I think they want to encourage all of us, as I said, uh, as well as primary care workers, hospitals, public health, to be able to not lose sight of the challenges that are before us. Uh, Chief Nolan added that while paramedics often take a reactionary approach to emergencies, community paramedics are shifting their stance now to be able to be part of the solution but the first obligation is to raise the flag and say there is a problem that needs to be addressed. The County of Renfrew Paramedic Service has been working to sign on to the Naloxon Ontario Project through the Ministry of Health. Uh, for those of you that don't know what Naloxon is, it's a life-saving um, injection. Um, uh, far too many people don't know about it. Um, we're going to suggest public public information and education about people maybe that have someone in their family, someone that lives in their apartment that they know is a great person but has a substance abuse problem. Uh, these naloxone kits can be picked up by anybody at the pharmacy. Um, and this is why we say the paramedics don't find out about all the overdoses because sometimes someone does give the naloxone other than what we are aware of and saves a life. Now, um, phase two for the paramedics is working through the logistics of the naloxone supply and making sure that there's enough here for everyone to get it. 
Um, in the past, although there was naloxone kits available at local pharmacies, health cards were required to access them. And in some cases, those in need did not have a health card for the same reason. I mean, these are people with mental health issues often. Uh, he's seen paramedics go to the pharmacy, get a naloxone kit with their own health card, imagine that, and return to the family to show them how to use the Narcan. Nolan called the current situation the tip of the iceberg as he sees cases involving mental health and addiction increasing as the pandemic continues. He feels mental health should be prioritized with the same importance as physical health. Now, the mayor and I both agreed to bring this issue forward to you here at Pembroke Council tonight. Um, and I also suggested during the meeting that we uh, bring this to the attention of the provincial and federal governments. Um, all too often, rural communities, we fall short. Um, we don't have addiction treatment centers here. We don't have a detox center. I mean, you heard the report from the OPP not long ago. They're doing a lot of this type of work themselves now by having mental, uh, mental health workers, you know, attend sometimes when they know that it's a client. Um, so it's a community thing and we all have to support uh, all of this. Now at the, I won't belabor this much longer, but this is such an important thing and I mean, uh, you know, it's our entire community at State Care. At the meeting, the Health Committee passed a resolution which will be forwarded to County Council at the end of the month. The resolution directs Warden Debbie Robinson to prepare a letter to be sent to the Renfrew County District Health Unit acknowledging the current opioid crisis and requesting the County of Renfrew and Paramedic Service engage in collaboration with the Health Unit to address this crisis. Um, at the next council meeting, I am going to be asking uh, the mayor uh, to draft um, a letter to be sent on behalf of the city council and the mayor, asking that the city also be represented and be engaged in this collaboration with the health unit and the, and the county. Um, and further to that, a letter outlining this crisis, addressing the inequity of resources including inpatient, outpatient treatment facilities in our rural community be sent to the members of provincial and federal government. And I'll close by saying, um, to make this even worse, I mean, this week we all heard the announcement about Greyhound. That leaves a lot of these people, again, further risk. Uh, they don't have a way or means maybe to go to Ottawa or to Belleville or wherever they need to get this treatment. And they don't have the support of family either. So I thank you for listening to this report. Uh, I think there was a lot of, oh, at the meeting, like we knew it was bad, but we didn't really even understand the numbers. So thank you for giving me this time tonight. Thank you, Councillor Jackano. Your Worship, as the representative on the Rent County Housing Authority, I'd just like to bring a short report. Your Worship, you and I exchanged a few words this week on the accommodation crisis that's taking place uh, with the housing units. Uh, we see, uh, first of all, that there's a, uh, a great deal of displacement by people uh, due to the fact that homes are being sold because the property values within the area are increasing dramatically. Uh, so anyone that may be renting in a home that may be a little bit underprivileged is having difficulty finding somewhere else to go. And consequently, that is all in relationship to increasing the number of people that are homeless. Uh, there's a lot of infilling uh, going on within the community. Wherever you see an empty lot these days, you seem to see development, houses being built, uh, townhouses, etc. Uh, a lot of those homes, you know, are being built by contractors who, of course, want to uh, receive, uh, you know, a portion of uh, some profit back from their expense and they're not always geared to income. So that means that they're, you know, they have a select uh, clientele that may be, uh, for, uh, may be renting from them. Uh, the other thing is uh, statistic, there's over a thousand families in Renfrew County waiting for a place. That's a lot of people. When you look at our population being just under 100,000 people, that's a big, uh, it's a big proportionate uh, percent, percentage. Uh, when we look at Toronto, uh, we know there's homeless people there. There's 15,000 people sleeping on the streets in Toronto. You know, we have the homeless here as well. 
and as I said to the mayor this week, we had a hobo jungle. Uh, this is not unusual. I mean, homelessness is not something that has just happened the last decade. It's been around for a long time. Uh, across from City Hall, where the CN uh, train terminal used to be, you know, uh, people would hop their freights and they travel across Canada. And the terminal was Pembroke. So off they'd get and they would live in the little area in behind where Tim Hortons is and uh, Eastside Mario's down in the little forest area. There was a number of people lived there. So things have not changed. What has happened is, though, things are getting more intense. There's more people. There are more homeless people. Uh, the county did receive a one-shot deal of $250,000, uh, new money to help with adjunct projects uh, for the homeless. And, uh, you know, they're spending this money in places where they see fit. Uh, one other thing, uh, there's got to be more uh, collaboration between private contractors, the county of Renfrew, and central mortgage and housing. Uh, there are programs available to... Uh, you know, if you can avoid the bloody red tape, that seems to be the problem. You have a contract that may be interested. He looks at the 45 pages he's got to fill out. He needs some assistance. He's not going to spend all that time filling out paperwork when his job is to build homes and provide accommodation. But there are programs. If uh, local contractors are interested, they can ca contact the County of Renfrew, uh, Central Mortgage and Housing, uh, to dwell, to delve into, uh, you know, affordable housing units that are available. And there is a need. Uh, what else did I want to say? Uh, basically, uh, I'd like to recognize the tenacity of Warden Robinson and the committee. Uh, they're not letting go. They're not saying, uh, you know, to the premier and to our local member, uh, listen here, we're just going to stick our head in the sand and go away. We have the same problems that you do in Toronto, Etobicoke, and other places. Uh, we're smaller, but you cannot turn us away. Come up with some solutions for us. Give us some alternatives. You're not looking out for, you know, the continuous handout because taxpayers' money comes from the taxpayer. That's you and me. But there may be other options where they can deal with private contractors to make alleviate the situation. And as Councillor Fernier said, you know, the opioid crisis is part and parcel due to probably these people becoming desperate. If you don't have a place to live and desperation uh, is all you've got, then you have few al few alternatives but to look for perhaps, you know, opioids and drugs to relieve that depression and stress, which is not the right thing, but these people are lashing out at what is happening to them. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, members of council. Thank you. Any other, no other reports? Uh, the confirming bylaw, Councillor Giacono. Mine's on. Yeah. Councillor Giacono, your mic. Did you call me Mike, Your Worship? <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Just joking, Your Worship. Uh, bylaw number 10, that's 2021, moved by myself, seconded by uh, Deputy Mayor Gervais, that bylaw 10. Dash 2021 to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of the Council of the City of Pembroke of May 18th, 2021, be adopted and passed. And further, that said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation of the City of Pembroke, and it awaits your signature, Your Worship. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Moved by Councillor Reevy, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favor? We are now adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.